TS-92 um, with the Discovery Space Shuttle. Uh, his flight, STS-72 with his Space Shuttle Endeavour, and STS-65 with the Space Shuttle Columbia. Now, um, he also had the opportunity to fly on the Russian Soyuz rocket, and um, with that, he was on the uh, uh, special TMA-5 um, expedition to the International Space Station, where he spent over six months um, on the International Space Station. So I'm going to um, welcome Dr. Chow here to talk to you about what it's like to be, uh, to be in space, and then also to answer some of the questions that your teachers have submitted. So please welcome Dr. Chow. Great. Well, thank you, Elias, and welcome, everyone. Welcome to uh, uh, Space Week here at the Space Foundation in Colorado Springs. Uh, as you just heard, my name is Leroy Chow, and I'm an astronaut. Uh, I can't remember a time when I wasn't interested in airplanes and rockets, and I built a bunch of models when I was a kid, uh, but it was the Apollo 11 moon landing that really inspired me to want to become an astronaut myself. Uh, I was eight years old at the time. I was in third grade, and I can remember very clearly watching that old TV set as, as the lunar lander approached the surface of the moon and actually touched down, and then Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin actually took the first steps of any human beings on another planetary body. So that's what started the dream for me. And I worked very hard in school. I, I studied engineering. I went to school in California at the University of California at Berkeley in Santa Barbara. Um, I studied chemical engineering, and I was working as an engineer first at a, an aerospace materials company and then at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory when I put my application into NASA and uh, was very excited seven months later to get a call from NASA inviting me to come down and interview. And then four months after that, I was even more excited to get the call inviting me to join the next astronaut group. So I went back to, to Houston. I moved to Houston, and that's where I've lived now for 24 years. I spent 15 years at NASA. Uh, training and flying in space, and as you heard, I had the good fortune to fly four times in space. My first three missions were on space shuttles. Um, as you heard, my first mission was aboard Space Shuttle Columbia. And we were a space lab mission, which means we were doing mostly scientific uh, research and investigations in space. On my second mission, I got my first chance to go out and do spacewalks. What we were doing were right, and 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 construction and techniques that we would later use to build the International Space Station. Then on my third mission, I got to put some of that into practice. I went up on Space Shuttle Discovery, and we actually brought two pieces of the space station with us. We used the robotic arm of the station to position those pieces, and then over four spacewalks and two teams, we went outside and used tools to put those pieces down, and then uh, actually uh, made it the electrical connectors to bring everything to life. On my fourth mission, I got to go fly with the Russians. This was really an exciting thing because uh, I was training to go live on the space station on what turned out to be a six and a half month flight. So you, you kids out there, think about it. Six months in space, that's two thirds of a school year. Imagine spending most of a school year up in a series of basically little tin cans. And so you're up there living and working in space with a fantastic view of the Earth, uh, but you can't go home, you can't uh, go visit your friends, you're, you're kind of stuck there. So you have to really think through whether that's the kind of thing that you want to do. But uh, after a couple of days of thinking about it, I decided I did want to do it. It was a big commitment. The training was about three and a half years. We had to go back to school again. Kinda. I had to learn the Russian language, and maybe some of you were studying some, or you know, being introduced to some foreign languages. I had to, I had to learn uh, uh, Russian, and the Russians had to learn English. So we traveled back and forth uh, every other month. We were in either in Russia or in, in Houston training for the mission. So I got to launch on Soyuz TMA-5, which was a Russian space vehicle, and if you uh, have a chance. You can look at a map after this session, and you can, or a globe, and find Kazakhstan, the country of Kazakhstan, and you can look east of the Aral Sea. That's where the launch site was. That's where the Russians launched from. So we flew up to the International Space Station. We did research work. We did repair work and maintenance work, and and uh, that was really a, a neat, neat deal. I got to do a couple of Russian spacewalks, which was really a treat because I've become an expert doing spacewalks using American spacesuits and tools, and I uh, got to help build the space station even a little bit more. Since leaving NASA, I've been doing a few different things. As you heard, that I'm, I'm a special advisor for the Space Foundation here, and it's really a treat to talk to young people like you to, to kind of get you inspired about what we do in space and you what we'll be doing in the future. The idea is to get to, the, to Mars, back behind me. And who knows, maybe one of you kids, yeah, you, might be one of the, you might be the first person on Mars. That's something pretty cool to think about. 
What we're doing in here right now, we're building the next generation spacecraft. Now that the space shuttle has been retired about three years ago since we were building the station, uh, we're building the next generation vehicle called Orion. It's being built by Lockheed Martin just up the road from here, uh, prime contractor. Uh, we are also building a new family of rockets called the Space Launch System, which will take Orion into orbit. And also a heavy lift version is going to launch the other pieces of the spacecraft we'll need to go what we call beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, we'll need things like an Earth departure stage, which is like basically a big gas tank with rocket engines, so we can rocket that stack out of uh, Earth orbit. We'll have to develop landers for when we go back and land on other other planetary bodies. And so there's very exciting things up up ahead in space. I think probably the best use of the time, since we're getting a little bit of a late start on this session, is to go ahead and answer questions. I know there are a lot of questions uh, Elias has, has gathered, and so why don't we go ahead and jump into that. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we're going to um, uh, ask some questions that you guys have submitted. Um, first off, from Miss Isaacson's classroom, this comes from Caitlin, Aiden, Christina, and Sarah. How much and what type of training is needed to become an astronaut? Well, basically, being an astronaut, it means you're always training. So when you first show up at NASA with your class, uh, you know, we were all from different walks of life. We were research engineers like me. We had military test pilots from the other different services. We had a couple of medical doctors, a couple of physicists. We all came together, and we started training on what, what happens at NASA, how the different centers work together. We started training on space shuttle systems and how those systems interact. And we started training on procedures and simulators on how we were going to go and uh, fly space shuttles. We had to do training for the spacewalks. Uh, I mentioned the training that I had to do to go fly on the space station, including learning the Russian language. So basically, you're always training. We also have to do physical training because we have to stay in good shape. You have to, your bodies have to be healthy in order to be able to go up into space. Um, you have to do, you know, just you're always training, and and that's actually a lesson for you in life. Is uh, you know, school doesn't end when you finish elementary school or high school or even college. Uh, you're training your whole life. You're always learning if you're moving ahead, and that's what it's all about. Thank you for that question. This next question is going to be um, was asked both by Miss Isaacson's class as well as Miss Bonnie's class. Is it painful, or what is it like when you come back to Earth and back to gravity? That's a great question because uh, it's really quite a change to go up into space with no gravity, and then to come back again. It's another big change to come back because you've gotten used to being no gravity. In both cases, you're very dizzy because your balance system, uh, when you go up into space, it starts uh, sending information to your brain that it doesn't understand, so you get dizzy. And then when you come back, you've been in space, even if you've only been in space for a few days, you forget how to use that information coming from your balance system, so you're dizzy again. Also, even though you've been exercising in space, and we exercise two hours a day on the space station to stay in shape, uh, you're not used to using your muscles. You're not used to walking, and so you kind of have to relearn how to do all those things. And so it can take, you know, it can take several weeks before you feel like you're kind of back to normal. So along with that, um, Miss Svazis' uh, uh, class, I hope that I pronounce it right, Miss Svazis' class asks, so what does zero gravity feel like? Yeah, zero gravity, it's, it's, uh, you can actually create that feeling on the Earth because the right physics, the physics of zero gravity is a free fall. Now that might sound kind of terrifying if you've ever been on a roller coaster. When you come over the top of a roller coaster, you're weightless for just a few seconds. And also we can do that in airplanes. We get in airplanes to go fly the, the same profiles as a giant roller coaster. And basically when you're coming down, you're falling, but you're inside the airplane. And so the difference is that your eyes don't tell you you're falling when you're in space or when you're in that airplane. That's why you don't get that feeling like your stomach's coming up into your throat that you do on a roller coaster because your eyes are telling you you're falling. And so that's what kind of gives you that fear or that feeling. So it's actually very free. It's very, very, you know, to float around, it feels very good. The way you can kind of get an idea of how it feels on Earth is to get into a swimming pool if you're wearing like some goggles or a mask so you can see and just totally relax in a swimming pool. The physics aren't correct because you're still in, in gravity, but uh, it, feels about, it feels about the same. You can get an idea. Very good. And also from Miss Father's class is. Um, have you ever accidentally pushed a button, and what happened? <laughs> yeah, we really try hard not to make mistakes. Uh, inevitably, you're going to make some mistakes in space, and uh, fortunately, I have not done made any serious mistakes in space. Uh, there's a, um, I think there was one switch I left misconfigured because there was a discrepancy in the procedure, and so 
Um, I could say it wasn't really my fault, but uh, as, as the commander of the mission and as the flight crew, I should have asked instead of uh, doing what I thought was right. So it was a very minor switch throw that was wrong. It left part of the communication system in a different configuration uh, when we were configuring the station to go out and do what we call a relocation, where we took our spacecraft and moved it from one port to another. So it did cause any problems, but it was a mistake. Okay. Try not to make too many of those on the International Space Station. So. Um, can you tell us real quick, Ms. Thesis class would like to know, what does it feel like on liftoff? Sure. On liftoff, uh, on the space shuttle, you definitely knew that you'd lift it off because the big solid rocket boosters, the white solid rocket boosters on the side are solid fuel. So at zero, uh, those both are ignited, and instantly they add almost 5 million pounds of thrust. And so you feel it feels like someone just kicked the back of your chair, and you know you're on your way. Um, by contrast, with the Soyuz, they're all liquid engines, so they just throttle up very gently, and then you just gently rise off the pad, and you don't even feel lift off. And that's kind of weird, because the only way you know you lift it off is you know what time you're supposed to lift off, and you also hear the launch officer announce lift off. So they're quite different experiences on two different rockets. Something that you don't think about is the different feelings of right. the rockets. Now, uh, also, Miss Thesis class would like to know, um, when did you first realize that you wanted to be an astronaut? Yeah, basically, you know, like I said, I've always been interested in, in flying and airplanes and rockets, but it really was the Apollo moon missions that got me thinking about, gosh, I want to be like those guys who were up on the moon. And so it really was at the age of eight watching that, that landing. Very good. And uh, Miss Bonnie's class, um, how do you sleep? in space. Are you just floating around? Or what, what <laughs> you could, you could like? just float around, but actually what we do is, is on the space station we have little uh, sleep chambers or little crew quarters which are about the size of a phone booth and so you can just get in there and, and zip yourself up in your sleeping bag and kind of float around in your quarters. On the space shuttle what we used to do is zip ourselves up on our sleeping bags but we had each end tied off so that you wouldn't float around and, and bump into things. Good. Now we're going to uh, move to Miss Womack's classroom. Uh, Lizzie would like to know, would you say you have fully accomplished all of your goals as an astronaut and maybe even as a professional? Uh, that's a great question. I had a very rich flying career at NASA. Um, I got to fly on space shuttles. I got to help build the space station. I got to be the commander of the station. I got to do Russian spacewalks. I got to fly in a Russian Soyuz. And so I can't complain at all about the richness of the flying that I got to do. Um, I, when I was a kid, of course, as I was talking about, I was inspired and wanted to go to the moon. I never had a chance to do that because we haven't had a moon program since Apollo. The last mission to the moon was 1972. So I won't say that you know it, it was unfinished business because uh, there, there, there just wasn't a possibility. Um, so professionally, though, no. I mean, I, the, the idea is you want to keep going. And so I've been doing a lot of different things, some of them space-related, like here at the Space Foundation, some of them um, in other fields, too. So no, I'm still I'm still going forward, and I think that's the bit, main thing is that uh, I don't think any of us who are driven are re ever really finished. Right, and that basically is um, based on what you enjoy doing. Exactly. Which right. which kind of uh, um, comes into play in this next question from uh, Shaley, also in Miss Womack's classroom. Mm -hmm. um, looks like she did a little research, and she <laughs> asked, uh, "What made you decide to go to college for science?" And what then made you switch from being a chemical engineer to being an astronaut? Right. Well, you know, studying engineering was something natural because I was interested in technical things, you know, airplanes, rockets, and, and uh, I used to make little uh, uh, radio kits and things like that. And so I studied engineering, and I actually started intending to be an electrical engineer, but then I found I was actually more interested in chemistry when I started taking chemistry, so I switched to chemical engineering. And I was working on things that I enjoyed. After I came, got out of college, I was doing research work at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. But I'd always had that dream of wanting to be an astronaut. So I, I knew I was going to apply. And once I got accepted, I changed careers from being a researcher to an operator. And now I'm kind of switching halfway back. <laughs> Definitely follow your dreams. Um, so the, here's a combination between uh, Haley, uh, also in Ms. Womack's class, mm -hmm. as well as a question coming from Ms. Matthews' class. Um, asking you, were all the years of college, all the years of training uh, to be an astronaut, was all that effort that you put into it, was that worth it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, anything that you want to do, you're going to have to learn about, you're going to have to train, you're going to have to be educated on, you're going to have to practice. And so, absolutely, it's, it doesn't matter if you want to be an astronaut or, or a researcher or a teacher or uh, a musician or a, a, you know, somebody who writes literature. 
Um, well, no matter what it is, you've got to train on it. You've got to practice. So it's it's hard work. Nothing worth doing is easy. Nothing is easy. So you should do something that you're passionate about because you'll you'll enjoy that work. And that's that's really the main thing. That's where the whole uh, space missions and going to the moon came from too. Is not doing the easy things, right? But doing the hard things, right? Challenging yourself. Very good. So um, here's a great question from Miss Matthews' classroom. Uh, Miss Matthews' class asks. How has science changed life? Well, science has changed life quite a bit. Just think of uh, back in the caveman days, you know, when the first cavemen kind of figured out how to make tools. They were able to then effect more effectively go out and hunt. Uh, they discovered the way how to make fire. Now, you could argue that they were the first scientists, first human scientists. And so that has evolved into what we do today. And look how quickly technology is booming from the invention of the airplane just after the turn of the uh, 1900s to you know, 60 years later, 70 years later, we're landing people on the moon. Now we've got a space station up there that we're, we've got a crew on permanently, always, always a crew on board, and we're making plans to go to Mars. So that shows you how quickly science and engineering is changing our lives every day. Good. Um, in Mr. Bashansky's classroom, Matthew is, would like to ask, um, what did you do in training um, and what was your favorite thing to do in training? Well, in training, you know, we train for everything, like I said. Uh, probably my favorite thing, the most fun part of training, is getting to fly the T-38 jets. You probably know that NASA maintains a fleet of these supersonic jet trainers, and therefore us to practice crew coordination, working as a team and working in a flight environment where it's very non unforgiving. And so uh, that, but it was also the most fun, you know, getting to fly these jets and go either traveling where we had to go do business or have meetings, or just going out over the Gulf of Mexico and doing aerobatics. That was probably the most fun thing we did during training. Good. Um, Aiden from Mr. Bashansi's class would like to ask, how was it to take a spacewalk and work outside of your spacecraft? That was probably the most exciting parts of, of my career, my flying career, was getting to go do spacewalks. I mean, actually getting outside the spacecraft uh, was what I call a surreal experience. I couldn't. I almost was wondering as I was doing it, am I really doing this or am I dreaming? Even, even though I've done six of them, even the last one was kind of that way. Um, but it was really a great experience, but at the same time, it's a lot of hard work. It's physically very difficult to work in, in a suit because you're working inside a balloon, but uh, that was probably the coolest thing. That's a great question. Um, Taylor, um, Taylor from uh, Mr. Bashansky's class would like to ask you, how did you feel when you first found out that you were going to be an astronaut? Oh boy, that was sure was exciting. I got a phone call early in the morning because I lived in California at the time, and it's two hours time difference between Houston and California. And so for me, it was very early. It was about seven in the morning, I think, when they called me, and I was just waking up or about to wake up. And uh, you know, it, it woke me up right away when I heard who it was. It was NASA calling, and um, the, the person I was talking to is somebody named Don Putty, who was in charge of the selection after that that time. And um, I knew it was important if he was calling me, and he kind of made a little small talk, and I was kind of waiting for him to get to the to the uh, substance, and he asked me if I'd like to come down and join the next astronaut class, and I told him uh, absolutely, and that was something I'll never forget. A very exciting moment. That sounds great. Um, from Miss Coster's class, Ella would like to ask. How did microgravity affect your body when you were in space? Yeah, microgravity definitely does affect your body, sometimes I mean, in very noticeable ways and sometimes in more subtle ways. When as soon as you get up into space, you feel immediately dizzy you, because your, your inner ear is, is sending information to your brain that it's not used to getting because everything's kind of rattling around. And so you feel dizzy right away. You feel a little full-headed because you don't have gravity pulling all the liquid down into your legs, and so it feels a little bit like you're standing on your head or, or laying on a horizontal with your head down. And uh, over, in fact, over the next two days, that day or so, your body will eliminate two liters of water. So imagine one of those big soda bottles. That's how much less water you carry in your body in space. There are also more subtle biomedical effects. In fact, the biomedical effects are the most important thing we have to figure out how to keep astronauts healthy before we can send people to Mars. It's not anything to do with rocket engines or computers or anything like that. It's we got to figure out how to keep people healthy. Good. Um, Olivia in Ms. Coster's class uh, would like to ask, why did you first want to become an astronaut? Right, and so it was, uh, you know, like I said, I was watching those those guys on the moon, and I, I just identified with them. I said, you know, I want to be like those guys, and unfortunately, I didn't get to go to the moon, but as I said before, I had a very rich flying career, so I'm not complaining at all. all right. 
Well, we have time for uh, one more question, and this is a really um, interesting question that comes from Ms. Coster's class. Okay. It says, would you rather ride on the last Soyuz uh, voyage uh -huh. or the first uh, voyage of Boeing or SpaceX's space taxi? That's a great question because it's very interesting. The Soyuz is an old design. It was designed in the 60s, 1960s. So that's, you know, 50, 60 years ago almost. And it's been steadily upgraded, but it's a very reliable, proven spacecraft. Now, counter that with the, the spacecraft that Boeing and SpaceX are developing. They're brand new spacecraft. They're very modern. They employ the latest, of, you know, things that we've learned over the years. And so it'd be interesting, you know, to choose which one you're going to fly. And for me personally, I'd like to fly on the new ones because I've already flown on the same ones. So it's, uh, I, you know, I'm always looking for the new thing, and I think these spacecraft are going to be great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Chow, yeah, for my pleasure. Uh, coming and uh, taking time with <laughs> us. Um, thank you guys for your questions. Um, I hope that you enjoy World Space Week. Um, feel free, if you have some more questions about space, ask your teachers, and your teachers can email us uh, here at the Space Foundation. You can also find us on the Internet at uh, spacefoundation.org. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this time, and uh, thank you again for joining us. Good Have luck, everyone. Bye-bye. Good luck. <laughs>